Jean Well, I'm the past president of Tales of Cape Cod, and I wish to welcome you this evening. Um, normally, we do not promote the events of other organizations, um, other not-for-profits, but I'd like to make an exception. I brought a stack of flyers this evening um, for the Pop Gala, which is scheduled for this Saturday evening here in Barnstable at the Dillingham House on Commerce Road. POP stands for Protect Our Past. Uh, you may have seen their first film that they released uh, called A Love Letter to Cape Cod. They are producing a second which will be shown at the event Saturday evening, but this is a fundraising gala on behalf of POP. Their mission is very closely aligned to Tales of Cape Cod. Um, they focus on the restoration and preservation of historic structures, historic buildings. Those things that really make Cape Cod unique, in my opinion. And given the amount of work that we have done on this building, we're natural partners. So please pick up a copy of, brochure, of the flyer and hope to see you Saturday night. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Here, take this stupid thing off. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm in the land of the living now. Um, next week, we have a popular author, Don Wilding, who will present the Portland Gale, a tragic sinking that occurred during a rogue storm in 1898. This week, we are privileged to have Laura Orleans and Captain Rodney Avila with us to discuss the history of New Bedford commercial fishing industry. They will show us how, for the New Bedford community, commercial fishing is more than a job. Our sponsors are the Town of Barnstable's Tourism Grant and Jeffrey and Nancy Belzikian. I don't know if they're here tonight, but if they are, I would like to thank them. <laughs> After the program, I invite you all to partake um, our dessert reception put on by the lovely Jude, and um, thank you very much for those of you who have brought goodies to share. Um, the speakers will also be offering copies of their book, Voices from the Waterfront, and a DVD, Finest Kind, featuring Captain, for, for sale. So I hope you look at those and be able to chat with our speakers at that time. Laura Orleans is a graduate of Oberlin College and has a master's in folklore from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She was the founding director of the Working Waterfront Festival and the past program coordinator for the New Bedford Whaling uh, National Park. In 2014, she founded the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center, which is dedicated to preserving and presenting the story of commercial, 
fishing industry, past, present, and future, through archives, programs, and exhibits. Captain Rodney Avilia has been a commercial fisherman for approximately 60 years. He comes from a long line of fishermen and has participated in most of the fisheries of New England, including ground fishing, sword fishing, scalloping, and lobstering. He has been involved in fishing management as a representative of the New England Fisheries Management Council. He has also been a strong advocate for the fishing community and has worked particularly hard to provide safety trainings for his fellow fishermen. And I'm very proud to present both these um, very interesting people from New Bedford. Well, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. And we're going to kind of tag team. We did not rehearse this. We've done this a lot um, for various audiences over the years. Um, so I should correct. Rodney tells me that it's really only been 47 years, but he's been a boat owner for longer than that. And if you look at the six generations of his family, we've got 120 years or so of history that he encapsulates. So um, sorry. A little bit back. Ah, OK. Yes, thank you. Um, so indeed, more than a job, that's actually the name of the exhibit, um, the main exhibit in our Fishing Heritage Center, and that comes from my 25 years of, of talking to people in the fishing industry and learning from them about what they do. You know, it's, it's a way of making a living for sure, but that's not all of it. In fact, I think for most people, they would say it's really a way of life, it's a culture and a community, and that's kind of what we try to put uh, forward. So commercial fishing, they say, is one of the oldest industries in America. We could say that it's been going on for over 400 years. This In New Bedford, um, while commercial fishing did parallel and go alongside whaling, I mean, it was a lot of people farmed in the farming season and fished in the fishing season. The story that we tell at the Heritage Center really dates from around 1909. And so we kind of talk about the importance of the commercial fishing port from that point forward. Oh, and I guess I need to. All right, Rodney, I'll be up. <laughs> Let's see. Do we need to be pointing at something down there? It was giving us trouble before, too. I don't know. Where's your tech guy? If he sets up a keyboard, maybe I can. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Knowing that you're very interested in history, that's not always what we talk about, but I did want to sneak in a little bit of history about the, the boats. So the earliest commercial fishing vessels were powered by wind and made of wood, and they included cat boats, sloops, and small schooners. In the early 1900s, New Bedford transitioned from small inshore fishing boats to schooners that were capable of going offshore. Oops. Schooners used elsewhere to transport dories or small rowboats, I think you all know what a dory is, to handline for cod were converted with engine power into net fish draggers. Oop. What have we got going now? Is it flipping? Okay. Oh, then we want to go the other way. <laughs> we'll get it. This is part of the entertainment. Oop. We're going backwards. All righty. Okay. okay, so we're going to stay on this one here. Um, this is called an Eastern Rig Vessel. Um, so these are very few at this point in terms of you know, what's out there fishing. Um, there's a beautiful boat called the Rowan that was restored by Mystic Seaport, if you want to go see a, a living example. Um, but Eastern Rig Vessels have the pilot house located aft, keeping the steering mechanism close to the rudder. Before powered winches, the crew set out nets by hand, and they haul them over the side of the vessel. And eventually, hydraulics took over, and can Rodney I can jump. jump in there. This was actually a side trawler, which meant that it towed off two galluses, one forward, one aft. And they would have to make a circle when they set their net and then tow it. And then once you got the net alongside, you'd lift it in by hand. Six crew members would lift the net in by hand. So they choked everything down in the, the cot end, and then they'd lift it with a lock of takeoff. Later, they converted it to a stern trawler because stern trawler was more efficient. You can haul back faster, you can fish in hotter weather, and it was a lot easier. 
you would have a mechanical reel on the net, net reel that would wind the net in for you. No more breaking your back. Yeah, so this is kind of a famous boat, um, the Narragansett, and in 1963, the, that boat was launched. It was actually built by Blount Marine in uh, Warren, Rhode Island, but the first and last captain owners uh, were from New Bedford, or fished out of New Bedford, so Jack Jacobson being the first, and then Radar Bendixson the last. And it was revolutionary because it put that net reel on the back, so it was America's first stern trawler, as I've heard it told. Um, and uh, it, it kind of changed everything, I think. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about yeah, know, well, the benefits. If we use this, a side trawler, it would take us about 30 minutes to haul and set the gear. By switching over to a stern trawler, we could do it in 13 minutes. So it cut your time, which would give you more time fishing. And it was a lot easier on a crew because we used to haul back going into the wind or fair wind instead of being broadside going back and forth. So. And Roddy, what about the movement of the pilot house forward? Yes, the pilot house you? forward, uh, when I, I like the eastern rig because the men were always forward to you, you could watch the men all the time, but the pilot house forward made it a lot easier for the people that was fishing to uh, maneuver the boat, get it, go through fleets of boats, and uh, everything was brought forward, the engine was aft on that vessel. Now the engines, everything's forward. The galleys are forward, everything's there. So in hot weather, the crew do, don't have to cross the deck back and forth. When uh, everything was uh, eastern rig, if, if it was a storm, you had to cross the deck to go turn in or to come back or watch. A lot of people got washed overboard doing that. A lot of fishermen coming across. All right, let's go to the next. So um, once those stern trawlers came into play, uh, scallopers also adopted the western rig. There were scallopers back in the early 1900s, um, but that fishery didn't really get going, I don't think, until, what would you say, 60s? 70s. 70s, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, again, you can see the pilot house forward and the working deck aft. Dredges being towed with cables from the main winch and two boom cranes that set the dredges out and return them to the deck. I often, you know, people when they come to New Bedford, they'll take a walk down on the docks, maybe get an ice cream cone, and they come into the Fishing Heritage Center and they say, what am I looking at? How do I know the difference between this and that and the other? So the net drum on the back is going to tell you it's fishing for fish. It's a ground fishing boat. The um, uh, booms that are up tall, you know, the standing rigging like that is going to kind of point to a scalloper. If you see a boat with a uh, sort of a cage on the back, that's a clamor. I think lobster boats are a little bit more familiar to people. Yeah. You can kind of yeah. see, yeah. And this is a much safer for the crew because now if you want to call somebody on watch, they just come from their bump to the wheelhouse with slippers on. They don't have to get fully dressed and cross the deck, especially in the winter time. So made a lot safer. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So a lot of people don't know this. In fact, people in my own hometown don't know this, but today New Bedford is the nation's most valuable fishing port. Um, people, you know, if they're coming from out of town, they know about the history of whaling. They know that we were once the whaling capital of the world, you know, after Nantucket. Um, but today New Bedford is the nation's most valuable fishing port. People kind of think of Alaska, which catches the most volume of fish. <laughs> New Bedford employs just about 7,000 people directly in the fishing industry and in a combination of at-sea and onshore work. Feeds the world with an average of a million pounds of, of seafood entering and exiting daily. Lands over 110 million pounds of product annually, leveraging over $322 million in direct sales. And supports an $11 billion industry or economic activity, um, and that's billion with a B. So it's a really huge part of our economy. Uh, today's vessels are typically, I would say, 70 to 120 feet, yeah. roughly, um, and made of steel. Um, we often have kids coming into the center, and sometimes we talk about safety, and I say, why do you think fishing is dangerous? And a lot of them have been to the whaling museum, and they say, because your boat might get hit with a whale. And I say, well, hopefully that doesn't happen, and if it happens, unfortunately, the whale would probably be uh, injured in that. Um, it's really more about the weather and the wind. Um, it, and it's also, um, it, you know, it's not so much, I mean, the, the steel vessels are much safer, I think, and more sturdy than the, the wooden ones. But, yeah, but wind and weather and um, gear, which is very heavy. If you look at that picture, 
You'll see boats all lined up. We have 535 working boats out of New Bedford. That's one of the biggest fleets. They're not all people from New Bedford. We have people that come up from Virginia, North Carolina, down as far as Florida. They'll fish up here in the scallop season when it's out in George's Bank. Um, they'll use New Bedford as a base. Can everybody hear Rodney okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. He was a captain, so you know. So, yeah. I just want to make sure. Did a lot of yelling. <laughs> so, All right. the, like I said, there's 535. And people have asked me, because I do uh, walking tours for the uh, cruise ships, they said, what do you go around, counting every boat? And no, I cheat, my daughter sells the permits. <laughs> <laughs> so I know every year how many permits she sells. <laughs> All right, let's look okay. at the next one. So why are we so valuable? Uh-oh. All right. Hope you've all had dinner. Um, so sea scallops are today what makes us um, such a valuable fishing port. Back in the day, we were really known as a flatfish port, you know, for a long while. I would say for the first, I don't know, 60, 70 port. years. Yeah. Um, and they found a market for the flatfish mostly in New York, um, at Fulton's Market, initially anyway. But scallops uh, now and for the last 30, 20 or 30 years, um, hugely sustainable industry. Um, and the price is good. Uh, last year, we hit an all-time high. Um, during the winter of 22, scallops were selling for as much as $37 a pound at the auction. That was crazy. Um, those were specifically large scallops that had a market in high-end restaurants. Um, but they're, you know, for a good part of last year, they were averaging, I would say, 20 bucks a pound-ish. Um, of course, diesel fuel, if you all remember what happened in March of last year, went through the roof. So people were paying, I don't know, I mean, if you heard yeah, stories. Six dollars a gallon. Six dollars a gallon, and if you're taking 15,000 ga um, gallons, that's, do the math, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, so currently the average price of scallops is, is dropped back down, it's around between 12 and 15 dollars a pound at auction, um, but it's still good money. For comparison, in 1962, we know because we have a promotional film, uh, back when they were trying to build a market for scallops, 53 cents a pound. So, you know, obviously there's been inflation, um, but at that time they were serving them in the high school, in the school cafeterias. Can you imagine like going into your elementary school and sitting down to a plate of scallops? Pretty good. Well, when I quit scallop and it was 25 cents a pound. And when was that, Rodney? That was in, my last trip was in 1957, scallop. I got 25 cents a pound, I said, I'm going flat fishing. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Boy, oh, it is it? No, no, I think it no, might, it's is it not? Oh, it is. Boy, temperamental. You know what? I'm going to get over here. I'm going to do it the old fashioned Thank you. <laughs> Um, all right, so I always like to point out shoreside businesses because I think people forget that there's a whole um, infrastructure that's really important to keeping the effort alive. Um, so everybody knows, if you don't know anything about fishing, you kind of know that there's a boat and there's a crew, but you might not know all of these um, people. And actually, do we have a pointer on that, Rodney? That little thing? If you want to point, just if you look at the top left with me. Oh, oh no, now it's gone. <laughs> Well, we'll get to that one next. Yeah. It's one of those buttons anyway. There it is. All right, but let's go back to the... <laughs> I wasn't done there. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Wait. Okay. All right, I'm just going to... So, Jeff Ferreira. There we go. Guy standing up. So, he is standing leaning against a bunch of truck tires. And I love this example because... Over the years, I've been so impressed by the resourcefulness of people in this industry. So, in his case... Rather than those truck tires ending up in a landfill, he and his family came up with this idea that you could take them and recycle them and turn them into the cookies, or donuts sometimes called, um, that are on the dredge there. Um, so that's the chafing gear, basically. Um, so that's, you know, his company, F&B Rubberized, produces the little disks that then get put on the scallop dredges. Uh, Blue Fleet Welding in the upper center there, that's Matt Lemieux, and he and his family produce scallop dredges. So there are a lot of family businesses, that's another part of this industry. Over on the right, Johan uh, Gunderson has uh, retired, but his father started this business called Scandia. They came from Norway, um, and his son uh, Gunnar Gunderson is now running the business, um, so they produce propellers um, for the industry. 
Down in the lower left, we've got Jim Dwyer, his father and his son. Um, they've all worked as lumpers. Lumpers are people who offload the catch from the, the fish hold when the boat returns to the port. I feel like I'm echoing in there. Um, Carlos Alberto is, uh, owns Luzo Fuel and also Luzo Fishing Gear. Um, they supply the boats, as you might guess, with everything from nets to fuel and, and other types of you know, clothing and things that you would need on your trip. And then lower right, okay, this is just the epitome of, of kind of being resourceful and resilient. This is Lori Botello. Lori started a company to make scallop bags. It was called Diamond Marine. So when scallops are shucked on the boat, they're put into muslin or cotton bags. The sizing is really important. The fishermen actually use it to sort of determine how much they're catching. They don't bring a scale. A scale wouldn't really work on a boat that's um, moving at sea. But when they're in a closed area, they're limited to a certain uh, poundage. So usually, right now, I think it's 15,000 pounds, 18,000 pounds. If they go over that by even 100 pounds, they can um, forfeit their whole catch and their penalties and so on. So they use her bags to, to figure it all out. So she continues to make the bags, but at some point, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, she saw New Bedford turning into kind of more of a tourist place, and she thought, I'm going to get in on this. And she opened a store that was called The Landing that's kind of a gift shop. And now they've moved, and they're called 41 North, but she sells in the front of the store all the stuff that tourists might look for, and in the back of the store, the scallop bags. Um, and I just I, I find that all really fun. All right, next. Oh, I'm sorry, and I meant to also say, as Rodney pointed out, we're also a hub port. So as a lot of smaller ports have lost their infrastructure, New Bedford still has everything that a boat needs. So boats from as far south as Florida and as far north as Maine can get, um, well, they can be built in New Bedford, but they can also be repaired. They can buy gear. They can have gear repaired. They can have their engine service. They can land their catch. They can sell it at the auction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really important port for all of those reasons. Um, and yes, diverse community, um, Anne mentioned that I was, I'm was i trained as a folklorist. Um, I've been really interested to learn how diverse and how many different people have come to the waterfront of New Bedford um, to make a living uh, in fishing. So they come from um, every every corner of the globe, but uh, this, this is the Skor family, Ellen and her two grandchildren. Um, they're from Norway, as you might know from the, the costumes. Um, and a lot of people come from Karamoy, which is near Stavanger in the western part of Norway. Anna Vinagre in the middle is a Fado singer. I don't know if anyone's had the pleasure of going to hear Fado music either here or in Portugal, but it's a, it's a vocal tradition that grew up in the port city around Lisbon. Uh, and it's very mournful. Usually they dress in black with a shawl. Um, if you saw the movie Passionata, they kind of portrayed the, uh, the Fado singing tradition. So a lot of Fishermen come from the mainland of Portugal and the areas around Lisbon, um, particularly Figueira de Foz and Buarcos, and then also the Azores, which is where Rodney's family comes from. We also have people from the Canadian Maritimes, from Poland and Latvia. Over here on the right, um, these two ladies are from Guatemala. We have a much a, a growing uh, community of people from Central America, mostly Guatemala, but also Honduras and El Salvador. Um, and also Mexico. We have a small Vietnamese community. They all came from a little island off the east coast of Vietnam as refugees in the 1970s. Um, they were fishermen there, and they became fishermen in New Bedford. So it's just they've all brought you know skills and traditions and cultural um, cultural traditions as well. All right. So fishing families. Rodney, who's on the left there? <laughs> uh, my son and my grandson. They both fish today. Uh, my they both scallop today. <laughs> Uh, we come from uh, six generations of fisher families. I'm the fourth. My son's the fifth. And my grandson's the sixth. And uh, that's that's a way of life for our family. Uh, I have um, I had seven uncles that were all in the fishing industry. Uh, I had three aunts that married fishermen on my father's side. On my mother's side, there was two uncles that were fishing. And my mother married Krishna. Her two sisters did marry Krishna. <laughs> but other than that, we're all locked into the industry one way or another. And then I was interested to learn that Rodney actually mostly learned to fish from somebody who was not in his family. I think it's also interesting. Maybe it's like learning to drive or learning to sail a boat. You're not supposed to do that with your spouse or your family member. But um, you learned to fish in Stonington, didn't you, Rodney? Yes. Partly? Yes. Yeah. Well, when I, when I was 18, I kind of wanted to spread my wings and I wanted to go see different types of fishing. So I moved to Stonington for two years and I 
grew up with, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I fished with the Rebel family. They had three boats, three boats at the time. The Lisboa, the Yao Gang, and the Portugal, and I fished on Portugal. I started on uh, New England, I'm sorry. The New England, the Yao the New England, the America, and the Portugal. Uh, I started fishing on the uh, New England, and then I moved over to Portugal one year, fish on that boat. And then they actually moved to New Bedford, and I came back to New Bedford. And Rowdy, at one point you told me a story about um, that you went fishing for a summer and you came back and your guidance counselor wanted to know what you were going to do. Oh yeah, when I was in high school, I used to fish summers. And uh, when I was getting ready to get out of high school and go fishing, my guidance counselor told me what my plans were. I said to go fishing. And he said, you know, I think you'd make a good teacher or a good instructor. I said, you're crazy. He gave me an aptitude test, and I said, that test is crazy. I want to go fishing. I don't want to teach anybody. I don't want to do anything. So I fished for 47 years. I, was, I owned boats for over 50 years. Uh, and then after that, I started doing safety classes, which was teaching. <laughs> 50 years, I was I did that. So. Well, the other part of that story that I love is, I think he asked you how much you made in a oh, summer. Oh, yeah. We were... <laughs> Back then, we were, he says, is there any money in fishing? I said, oh, I made $5,200 for some time. That was from June to September. He says, you what? I said, I made $5,200. He says, I worked all year for $3,800. <laughs> so. so on the other, in the other picture there, we have um, in the center, Radar Bendixson, flanked by his son's um, Tor on the left and Hans on the right, and then his wife, Kirsten, in the middle. Their daughter is named Tova. So with names like that, you can probably guess they come from, um, uh, sorry, from Norway. So Radar fished for 30 years, and as he fished, he began tinkering with the gear and making it a little bit uh, safer and a little bit more efficient and a little bit just better in different ways and actually patented three different devices. Uh, and then he kind of thought, you know, my kids are growing up and I'm not seeing them and I kind of miss being home. And so he came home in the 1980s and opened a gear shop, um, taking all that ingenuity and, and turning it in. You know, he knew as a fisherman what it took to make a good net. And so he became very successful with his shop called Radar's Manufacturing. Eventually, both of his sons have joined him. He's now retired. And what's interesting is now in 25 years, I'm seeing the passing of the torch. So, you know, the kids, Tor and Hans, have taken over. Um, the kids in Rodney's case have kind of taken over. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating. But you, you don't have to scratch too far down and you find just incredible ingenuity. We did an exhibit called FV Innovation. FV stands for Fishing Vessel. And we looked at all the innovators just in our local community because how inspiring is that for a young person to see, you know, just an ordinary person who's invented a new way to do something, you know, who's gotten a patent. Um, so go ahead. You can... All right, Rodney, I think this is your, your part. <laughs> Where do they fish, Rodney? I, I, I explain fishing like this. Today, I, I get paid as soon as I put that little tab into the clock, and it's 8 o'clock in my, I start making money. Well, when I leave the port of New Bedford, I owe money. <laughs> I owe for ice, I owe for fuel, I owe for groceries. Blue oil, rope, twine, anything that I might use on that trip, I have to buy it before I leave. Um, so I tell people that's the life of a fisherman. We go out owing. We don't go to work and start making money right away. So most of our fishing, most of the fishing I did, but this is New Bedford right here. Most of the fishing I did here when I was ground fishing or flat fishing or even scalloping was right here on George's Bank. Uh, when I sword fished in Tuna, did anybody ever see that movie, The Perfect Storm? Yeah. Okay. That's out here somewhere. <laughs> um, that's the Flemish Cap. That's right south of Iceland. So what happens is the, the Gulf Stream will come up, follow this contour at the bottom all the way up and get up there and turn around, go over to Europe and come down, go down by Africa and come back and get down into the Gulf of Mexico and work its way back up. Well, the water temperature, that's where the bait is. 
And that's where the tuna, the laughter, and the swordfish. And that's what I did for years, chase swordfish. Just like I knew them guys on that, Andrea Gale. I knew all of them. Uh, and that's why I used to fish. We used to make 33-day trips. 33-day trips. Now, you want to go to work and owe $100,000? Some of the trips, I would be what we call it a whole, $100,000 before I set Ice, fuel, I used to hold 24,000 gallons of fuel, 5,000 gallons of fresh water, put 40 ton of ice in the boat, groceries for six, six or seven men, sometimes I'd be six handed, sometimes seven, for 30 days, for a month, all that stuff. So you mount plus bait, you just have, have to buy enough frozen bait for a whole month. I had two holes, one was a freezer to keep the bait, and the other one was to keep fish. So, um, not too often, but I have my I have made trips where I owed a hundred thousand dollars, leaving the hurricane barrier in the back. So I had to catch a lot of fish. There's some time, some trips I came back and I didn't make the hundred thousand dollars, so I'd have to carry it over. To uh, but that's where most of the fishing goes right here. And then we have some fishing that goes along in here. It's called the Gulf of Maine up in here. We have a lot of lobster fishing that goes on in there. And a lot of um, ground fish and cod fish having up in there. Along this bank here, right in between here and there, is where the scallops are caught. And along here, that's called the George's Bank. That's where the scallops are caught. And then you have the Southern New England scallops was a light ship area, Great South Channel, and then you work all the way down towards Virginia. Believe it or not, I can tell by tasting the scallops what it was caught. And I tell people that, I said, I can't. The sweetest scallops are caught over here. Yeah. Those are the George's Banks. Those are the sweetest scallops. Sometimes if you go have scallops that are nice and sweet, the rubbery scallops. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Whoops. No, I hit the wrong button, huh? Now we're in trouble. You can go back. <laughs> yeah, let's go back first. Whoops. Too far. Too far. <laughs> oh, no, no. Huh? Too far. That way. Okay, there we go. So I was just going to add about how long, you know, the. You mentioned 33 day trips, so most of our boats aren't doing quite no. that. I would say the average is about 10 days, somewhere between 5 and 16, depending on what they're targeting. Yeah, if they're scalloping, they're doing anywhere between 7 and 10 days, depending if they're doing an open area trip or a closed area trip. There's two trips that can be done. Each scalloper has two closed area trips this year and 29, 28 or 29 open area trips. The closed area trips, they're regulated by 18,000 pounds. So they can go into, we have seven different closed areas starting. We have one there, one over there, and it goes all the way down the coast. Uh, depending on which area they go in, they can choose, no, they get allocated which area they go into. And they're allowed 70, uh, 18,000 pounds, no matter if they catch it in one day or if they catch it in 20 days. They, they're regulated by the poundage. The 29 days that they have, they can catch as much as they want. They come in with 40,000 pounds. So they generally, what my grandsons do is they break their 29 days into three, three trips, three eight-day trips, something like that. And the trip starts not when you put your gear down, but when you when leave the dock. So, yeah, sorry. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, we have Told you we didn't, boat, <laughs> we didn't we practice. We have tracks. It's a, it's a tracking system. It's similar to the, uh, when you go through a, a toll booth, the easy pass, similar to that. Well, there's, there's a trigger when they leave any harbor. It's generally outside of three miles, or, or the three mile line, generally. There's a, tr when they pass that trigger, that's when they clock stop. And their days start counting there until they come back on and clock out again. Now, if a boat's fishing, say from New Jersey, fishing up here on George's Bay, 
You don't want to see from New Jersey out to George's Bank because all of that time is 52 hours. All of that time he's clocking out. So what he'll do is he'll follow the coast three mile line so he doesn't clock in. <coughs> so he stays, follows the coast all the way up. <coughs> Excuse me, to do Bedford, goes into port and comes back out and clocks out. Because where he's going to be fishing is, right now the whole fleet, because I, I look at the fleet every day, every morning I, I check with my friends on top. We have what we call it uh, uh, marine traffic. You get it on your computer and you can track. So I, I just check with my grandsons out. So right now I have two grandsons and a southern law fisher right there, right there. I track where they are every day. Yes? Are you going to tell us where those rubbery scallops are? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, the rubbery scallops are uh, caught right around in there. I thought you were going to say they were the, the farmed ones from China. No, well, no, <laughs> those two. I couldn't compare them. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. I did want to point out that um, one thing that's changed quite a lot um, is the number of crew that are on a boat. So back when Rodney started, there really weren't limits of many, any kind, really. And so um, typically on a, a boat, you might have as many as 12 or 13, at 13. least on a scalloper. Yeah. Now they're limited to seven. In the closed area, I believe they can take an eighth person just as a way of getting, breaking a new person in. Um, and that was a, a regulatory measure with the idea that less people would do less, sort of ha have less effort on the resource. I think they just work a lot harder, honestly. It's a trip to New Bedford to go down the Heritage and you see it all. Um, yeah, we used to have 13 men, six on each watch, and cook all he did was cook. And uh, when you got up for your six hours on watch, we used to work six and six. Your six hours, of, all you did was cut scarves. The deck, you probably have a, a picture of a pile. Yeah. The decks used to come two dredges. Sometimes we'd catch so much scarves, we'd have to lay two and shuck them. And every one is hand up by hand. So. so just to give a little love to the other species, because we talked a lot about scallops, um, we do have actually a couple of crab fisheries, red crab right. and also we Jonah. Have the red, red crab, which is caught out short of the deeper water, out in the canyons, around 100 fathom of water. And then we have the Jonah crab, which is inside. The Jonah crab is probably what most people eat around here. And then we have the sea scallop. And, and you all know, do you know the difference between a sea scallop and a bay scallop? Perhaps yeah, not? they must know. Yeah, you get the cake. Cake. Yeah, right. <laughs> I usually say it's a little bit like the shell oil sign. The bay scallop is smaller and ridged, right, if you think of that yellow. The sea scallop is much larger and flat. So I just mentioned the sea scallop is the size of a soda can. The meat he's talking about, not the shell. Yeah. And then we have haddock and cod and flounder fishery. That's the traditional trawl fishery. Uh, we catch fluke, flounder, haddock, cod, pollock. That's, that's what we call ground fish. There's 27 of those species, different species that we catch. And then you have the Atlantic heron. That's called by larger ship, midwater trawlers that do not fish on the bottom. They fish mid, midway between the bottom and the surface. And they catch pelagic fish, which is mackerel, heron, squid. <coughs> and then we have the uh, Atlantic surf clam, which if anybody has these clam strips, that's that's what you're eating. Or oh, they use it for clam chowder. That's what they use for clam chowder. And then there's uh, lobster, which everybody loves. We catch them inshore and offshore, and all up and down the coast. Um, probably, so, I would say Maine is the most productive for lobster. And they actually they say that scallops are. Um, sort of in terms of dollar value in Massachusetts, scallops are up here, then lobster, and then oysters. Um, and we don't really talk about oysters, but we do have oysters, obviously, most of as well. Oysters are fun. Yeah. All right, next slide. Actually, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the whole ground fishing slide, Rodney, so you can keep going here. You want to explain how that works? <laughs> this is a traditional dragger. This is the South Hollow out of the Bedford. And he has two net reels side by side. Um, on my, my boat, I had two net reels, one ahead of the other. 
We always carry a spare net, spare net in case you tear up. You can throw the other one over. When we go down to George's <coughs> Bank and our days are counted, even on a trawler, they're counted from the time we clock out. We don't want to get over there and rip up a net and have to come back in and have all that waste of time. So I used to carry four nets on my boat ready in the water. Uh, so what, what it's like is like this. It's towed on the bottom and we have a, a sweep chain. You'll see it right there. And then we'll have the head rope which overlaps. So if a fish sees the, the chain and they want to tend to go up, they hit the weapon and go back in there. And on some of the new, uh, the new nets that are made now, we have escape vents for the small fish. But they have panels of webbing that they put in that are larger and let the smaller fish escape. So it's, it's a lot better to have a fish escape <coughs> on the bottom and bring them up through, through the water, temperature, uh, water pressure and have them inflate the, yeah. Yes? Yeah, on the 12 nets, um, do you just fish only where there's sand, or are they no. designed so that they'll bounce over the rocks? Yeah, we could put rollers on them so they'll go over the rocks. Put either rollers on, yes. What are your observations over the last three decades? I'll just put it that way. But in terms of the amount of fish available, particularly the cod fish, I and mean, I just out of the maybe misunderstanding that Cape Cod I mean, after the cod, there's virtually no cod out there in the Cape now. What, 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 what have you been experiencing? Okay, I see a whole change in the fishing, only because of the change in the water temperature. Okay. I mean, we're catching up here now, we're catching fish that are used to catch in Florida. Mm -hmm. Just the, I saw it the other day, there was orcas over here at Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. You've never seen orcas over here. Never the whole <coughs> orcas. All the time I was fishing, I've never seen orcas. Yeah. You have? No? Oh, I thought she said I have. Sorry. Uh, so the water temperature is changing, the feed is changing, and fish are like humans. We all go to the best restaurants, right? Same thing with fish, they, they follow the bait. So, it's, so, so have the fishermen adapted that way? They're catching a different kind of fish than they did 20 years ago? Uh, well, they, they, they're kind of locked into what they caught 20 years ago by the regulations. Oh. The regulations is you get your quota, your annual quota by what you caught 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. You're allocated. So you, you're kind of locked into that. And they have what they call a choke species. Like, uh, <clears throat> say you caught, you caught 100,000 pounds of each species, the 10 species that were there. In one species, you only caught 25,000 pounds of that species. If you caught 25,000 pounds of that species, you would be, get locked out of the rest of it. So that's why today, if they're catching too much, yellowtail is the choke species right now, yellowtail flounder. If they're catching too many yellowtails, they move to another area. Even if they're catching less cod or less flounder, whatever they're chasing, and then because they don't want to get lose the rest of their quota. If I can add a little bit, a couple of things that are going on. Um, so we talked a little bit about the nets providing some escape hatches. There's also a lot of really interesting work going on where fishermen and um, gear manufacturers and uh, fisheries biologists are kind of working together to figure out ways to design nets that are a little more targeted. I mean, it's not a perfect science. The fish don't necessarily follow the directions, but they have... <laughs> They have, I guess, discovered that codfish, when, when they see that sweep chain, I think it is, yeah, they'll go up and out. So if you have escape vents in the top, the cod will swim out. If you don't have quota to catch cod, whether or not they're there, the government regulates how much you're allowed to catch. So if you don't want to catch them because you don't have the quota, you want them to be able to go up and out, whereas you want to catch the haddock where there's plentiful haddock and lots of quota available. Um, and then the other thing that I would point out is, and we'll get to it um, a little bit later, is uh, just that I think we as consumers need to build markets for other fish because there are lots and lots of fish out there that are plenty tasty. It's just that, you know, we think about the fish that we're familiar with. So people want cod. I think haddock is actually a tastier fish myself. Okay. Okay. You see these here? These are called meshes. When I first started, they were four inches. Now they're six and a half. 
to allow escape on the bottom of the juvenile fish. You want the juvenile fish to escape on the bottom. Like I said, you don't want to bring them up because it's just like a diver. If they come up too fast, they get in the bins. Same thing happens with them. And this is like Fisheries 101 in rapid fire here, so we do invite you to come to the Fishing Heritage Center and learn a lot more. And but I anyway, tell let's try to, yeah. I get paid by the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide. Okay. Let's look at scallops. All right. <clears throat> Actually, this, this, this is a typical scallop here. They'll, the, these booms here are, uh, are stabilizers, there's outriggers. These are the booms that hold the dredges up. And there's, they'll double. You have two sides. So this is on one side with four guys picking, and you have the other side with another four guys picking. Yeah. They have to pick them up, put them in baskets, and then they shut them. They open them up there. The only thing they save is the muscle part of it. Everything else gets discarded. The, the net, is, I mean, the scallop dredge is a frame. It, by regulation, it can only be 15 foot wide. And there's three categories of scallopers. There's the full-time scalloper that can tow two of these 15 foot wide. And then you have the one dredge scalloper that can tow one 15 foot dredge. And then you have the day boat scalloper, which you have a lot around here, that can tow up to a 10 and a half foot dredge one dredge, and it's generally smaller boats, like 40, 50 foot boats. Yeah. And similar to the, the mesh on the dredge, on the nets, the, the rings have increased, so they were two right. and a half inches, I think. They used to be three inches, not then three, four and then. Half inches, mm -hmm. like so again, in an effort to preserve the juvenile scallops, yeah. And so how, how far do you go before you have to pull up the dredge? Is it a mile, is it five miles? They generally time it, it's by time. What they'll do is when you get out, do you mean how far from shore or how no, long? No, no, how long do you have to have it on the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. It's generally by time. What they'll do is they'll make a test tow. When you get out there, your first tow is a test tow. You might tow 10, 15, 20 minutes. And then you can judge it. They're pretty good. They can judge it by that. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you only make three minute tows. You know, probably you fill that dredge up in three minutes. So what's the water depth? It varies, like I say, they can start anywhere off of, are you familiar with like Block Island, Momata? They start from there and work out. Um, so we have boats that work right around Block Island, or south of Montauk, <coughs> New York. It'll probably be in 40, 50 feet of water. And then we have boats that will go out there in 25 feet of water. How do you avoid that by the <laughs> you don't quite listen to the radio. <laughs> now, when I first started, we only got two weather reports a day. We used to get caught in a lot of storms. <clears throat> now they have sophisticated satellite weather. They have, if you look at these boats, the doors, they can see it on this boat here. They have these domes up there, the satellite domes, they can get the weather report. They can get it 24 hours, just like you see the Weather Channel on TV. They'll get, they'll get the marine weather 24 hours a day, they'll update it. Uh, and that's how they know. But when I first started fishing, we had no radios, we had no, no satellites, nothing like that. We used to get caught in a lot of storms. You know, we just, the old timers would look at the weather and they'd say, okay, we've got a northeaster coming, guys. Get ready for it. Yeah, it. We never, when I first started, we never come. That's why we lost so many boats. We never came in. You were out there, you were out there. Because most of the time it got so bad we couldn't come home. And it's a lot safer to ride a storm off in the ocean than to try to fight it to get home. So, anyway, I, you want to go to yeah, the Yeah, let's go to the next. Yeah. So we got a bunch to get through and it's 10 of 8. Oh, my goodness. Uh oh. What happened, what happened there? Again? No. Oh, <laughs> there we go. All right. So when a vessel returns to port, we um, I, I told you about the lumpers. A lot of times the crew is tired and they'll hire lumpers. So this is down below deck 
in the fish hold. And basically they're the, taking out fish in this um, instance. Fish is stored on ice, so ice is still the preferred method of keeping the catch cold. They don't freeze it, they're just surrounding it with, by crushed ice. It's Anybody crushed ice. Anybody ask me why we use ice, not freeze it? Yeah. All right. Why we use ice? Because it, when, the, when a fish gets home, it has, gets ashore, it has to be processed, it has to be filleted. So a frozen fish, they can't fillet it. So that's why they use the ice bag. <clears throat> they can get as much meat, <coughs> me, as much meat on the fillet by it being non frozen They can just hug the bones when they get through, there's nothing on the bones, a good, a good uh, fillet. Can, so once offloaded, they'll take their catch usually to the auction, sometimes directly to a processing house that has a license to buy. But these two gentlemen, the Canaster brothers, Ray and Richie, started this type of auction in 1994. Um, up until that point, we had, oops, we had a more traditional auction with a chalkboard and, as they told me, a smoke-filled ro room. And it, you know, it was kind of fun to watch and interesting, but maybe not quite as fair. I, I heard lots of stories about, you know, you would agree on a price at the auction, and then when you went to offload your catch, the dealer would say, you know, I don't really like your fish. I'm not going to pay you. And then fishermen were kind of stuck because it's a perishable product, and you couldn't come back the next day and hope to get a better price. Um, so back in 1985, there was a, a bitter strike, and the public auction closed. Um, there were a bunch of temporary auctions, and eventually these guys opened a display auction. Um, now you can you buy... Uh, you can actually inspect the product before purchasing. So people are buying from all over the world, but they'll have local um, you know, representatives who go down and actually look at the product in the wee hours of the morning. You buy 1,500 pound lots rather than the whole boat. Um, and it's interesting, and Ray's daughter, Cassie, is now running the whole show there. So. Years ago, when we had the auction, before we had the display auction, the buyers would have to buy a whole trip because you couldn't break it up. So say I came in and I had 10,000 pounds of haddock, 12,000 pounds of cod, and 4,000 pounds of flounders. They run the cod, not the haddock and the flounders, but they'd have to buy a whole trip. So they, they'd figure out how to get that price down. So a lot of times how it went, when it, they used to bid up by uh, pennies, like uh, it's uh, two cents, and one guy was like, 205. <laughs> no, no such thing, but he wanted to bid. Another one go two and a half pennies. So work their way up. You never get that. And a lot of times when they got to 10 or 12 cents, you would get paid 10 cents. You wouldn't get to 12 cents. And, oh no, we're, not, we're only going to get paid 10 cents. So now they can buy just what they want, 1,500 pound lots. And so the vessel comes in and has to offload at midnight, by midnight. By 8 o'clock the next morning, the buyers send one of their representatives down, and they look at all the, lot, all the lots that are there, and they'll choose the fish for their buyer, and they'll put their tag on it. Um, they'll put their name and their tag on it. So they've bought that, that lot. So now it's a much fairer thing. They're just buying what they need, not buying a whole trip and have to resell something else. So, okay. um, processing is the other activity that happens. So once the catch is sold, the fish and well, scallops are kind of processed on the boat, but they need to be packed. Um, fish needs to either be filleted or skinned or scaled. Yeah, they, yeah. they fillet them. And, well, you've got the supermarkets that about fillet them for flounder or haddock or cod. That's what they do. All right. We're going to go faster just because I'm being mindful of time. Okay. All right. So the next, oops, nope, we're going backwards. <laughs> nope, one more. <laughs> okay. So how do fishermen get paid? They don't get a wage. They don't get a salary. They get paid a share of the catch. And this is something that goes back to the whaling days, really. Um, so basically when you come in, well, you want to explain, Rodney? When you come in with your catch, you sell to the auction, then you take the check to a settlement house, this is just one example. Okay, when you come in, you sell your trip, you go to the office, you get your trip. Say it's $10,000. You take it to the accountant, and then he'll, you'll have, like I said, when we leave, we owe money. I'm gonna open a $1,000 worth of fuel, uh, $300 worth of ice, maybe. Uh, You're doing uh, very small numbers. Well, I'm just bringing <laughs> 
$75,000. I heard $75,000 for fuel last year for a lot of these oh, scallop yeah. trips. <laughs> yeah, just well, to give you so just, sense. just to give you an idea, that's how it's broken up. Then after all the expenses are paid, the vessel pays part of the expenses and the crew pays part of it. So they, so they take it off the top. Then they'll split. Some boats will split 50-50, 50 for the crew to get divided by six men and 50 for the boat. And some go 40-60. Uh, They'll get 60% to the crew or 40% to the boat, depending on the boat. The boat. And often if you're just starting out, you might get a quarter share or a half well, share until you've that gets worked your way up. By the captain. Mm -hmm. If you're just starting out, depending on how hard you work, you might get a quarter share or you might get a half share. Very seldom you get a full share on your first trip, unless mm -hmm. you you're a real good performer. I'm, I've had guys that I've paid full share because they put that extra that extra in you saw them do it, even though they didn't have the knowledge, they were willing to help everybody do everything. So All right. That's how they paid me. Next slide. <laughs> All right. So I think. Um, when Ann introduced us, she mentioned that Rodney was very involved in safety training. So you may or may not know, but commercial fishing is considered the most dangerous way to make a living in the United States. It kind of goes back and forth between fishing and, I think, logging. I don't think it's a contest anybody should really want to win, um, but it's very dangerous. Um, the New England waters are the most dangerous, even though the deadliest catch is filmed off in Alaska, our waters are more dangerous. So in um, 2004, we, Rodney and I worked on producing that Working Waterfront Festival together, and it was the very first festival happened in September. And in December of that same year, a boat went down called the Northern Edge, <clears throat> and there were six fishermen on the boat. Five of them died. One of them survived. I think you said there were 22 fatalities that year. 26 fatalities. 26 fatalities in New England waters. Yeah, went up. And Rodney and some other people said, you know, this is crazy, this has to stop. And so it really took veteran fishermen like Rodney and, and others going to Alaska, getting the training, coming back, kind of spreading the gospel. And at this point, 20 years later, just about, um, safety training has been offered to thousands of fishermen. We, we, we perform safety training anywhere from Maine down to um, Virginia. We, Nobody's ever paid, I mean, the fishermen don't pay. It's free, we offer it free, we work off of grants. We get grants from the Coast Guard, and uh, we've trained over 6,000 fishermen. All right. All right, next slide. All right, this one is really close to my heart. So when I first got involved with this, I didn't know this. Um, but it's really true. I do, I've not yet met a fisherman who says, I don't want any regulations, and I want to catch everything I can. They, you know, people like Rodney have grandchildren that are fishing. They want this industry to continue. Even if they don't have family, they, it's their livelihood. If they catch all the fish, there's no, no way to make a living. Um, but a lot of fishermen are working together with scientists, and I think you really get good results. Um, that's going on now down in Woods Hole. It's been going on at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth for uh, a couple of decades at least. Down in Virginia, they've got Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And what I think really works is that the scientists are getting on board the fishing vessels, the fishermen are saying this is where we go fishing and this is how we set our gear, and the scientists are setting up the experiments so that they're, um, you know, valid scientific experiments, and the, there's a lot of trust built in that process. Well, I always started with fishermen in the science. Uh, we'd be fishing alongside the Institute of Bohemia, we the albatross, and I was, we'd be fishing alongside of it, they would be catching fish. We'd be loaded up our boats, and so we kept saying they didn't know how to fish. So most they started hiring fishermen to go on their boats, but they started hiring the fishermen they couldn't make it fishing. <laughs> so, so we went. And we said that that had never worked. We wouldn't trust any of that. We wouldn't have any confidence. So then they said, well, the University of Massachusetts says, well, how about if we put our scientists on your boats and you catch the fish? So that's how that started. And it's developed. Look, we have one guy down out of Virginia, Chimbu, uh, no, he's out of North Carolina. They, he's, that's all he does is take <coughs> different scientists out from Rutgers, from uh, uh, SMAS, from uh, Virginia Institute. All right. 
We're going to try and speed through the last okay. bit of this. Um, you guys all right for a few more minutes? Yeah, all right. Yeah. All right. So I will, I will encourage you to ask where your seafood comes from. I know it's complicated sometimes to know, but um, if you're eating American seafood, it's the most highly regulated fishing industry in the world. So you know that it is. They can't overfish. They're not allowed to by law. Um, I, and I would suggest eating wild fish. I think it's a more sustainable, environmentally friendly uh, practice. Um, I can give you all kinds of statistics, but I'm going to skip over them in the interest of time. So come to the Heritage Center and you can learn more about that. Lots and lots of underutilized tasty fish. The one on the bottom right there is a monkfish, if you don't know. They call it a poor man's lobster. But there's, there's fabulous fish out there. There are some restaurants in our uh, town that are, that are focusing on sustainable, abundant local seafood. Um, we've got lots of recipes on our website as well. OK, next. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna take just a quick minute to, to encourage you and, and entice you. Um, so the Fishing Heritage Center is a fairly new museum. We're about to celebrate seven years. Um, and we do really try to tell the story past, present, and future. Um, so thinking about workforce development and sustainable seafood is how we think about the future, but the present, it's a vital part of our community. So we don't relegate it all to uh, the history books, um, though there is a rich history. All right. Next. Our main exhibit, as I said, is called More Than a Job. It was developed um, during COVID. I mean, we kind of redeveloped it during COVID. There are 60 audio clips, so you can hear from Rodney and others um, who live this every day, and, and I think that's the best way to learn about anything. Um, and just, it's a, it's a really interactive, you, if you've got kids or grandkids, there's stuff to do, but somebody said to me, it's sort of like a kid's museum for adults because there's all this, you can push buttons and hear people tell stories, all right? Um, we have a small gallery that allows us to change out exhibits. Uh, currently, if you're interested in the history, I would encourage you to come soon. Up until July 9th, we have From the Hold. We partnered with a local history press to tell the story of the fishing industry from the 1860s to the 1980s. So it's um, historic photographs, and it's really interesting to see how things have changed, and in some cases, how they have stayed the same. Um, and then in July, we're transforming the whole thing to this sea monster is real and imagined. I'm very excited and a little scared because it involves a lot of moving parts. We're working with local artists. We're going to create a 32-foot sea monster. But we're looking really at the myths and legends out there. Every coastal community has sea monsters. So thinking about Portuguese sea monsters and Vietnamese sea monsters and so on and so forth. And also the real monsters that are in the ocean. So the kind of crazier um, mantis shrimp, for example, um, which is making its way up here. All right, next. Almost done. Um, we do have a growing collection. We initially had planned to just do a digital collection, but that didn't work out because the community had been waiting for years, I think, to have a place to really honor its history. And so people started coming in with boxes and photographs and documents and <coughs> stuff. Um, and so we are just on the, momentarily we'll be hiring an archivist, and we've actually hired him. I'm, I'm super excited he's going to be starting because we now have many boxes and files, and we need somebody to dig us out and professionalize the whole effort. But it's exciting, and I'm hoping a year from now we'll be able to launch a public archive that people will be able to, you know, look at online. So that's a new development. And lastly, um, if you enjoy eating seafood, um, our gala, happens on September 19th. It's a Tuesday night. It makes it really easy for the chefs to dedicate themselves. So we usually get somewhere between 12 and 15 chefs. We get local seafood donated by the industry, and the chefs go to town making really fun, interesting dishes that showcase everything from scallops and clams to lobster and monkfish and everything in between and oysters. And um, former mayors have come to the gala and said to me, you know, I used to have to go to this um, these galas all the time, not this gala, but you know, galas like this and the food was usually awful and this is all about the food. So it takes place at Cisco Brewers, which if you haven't been, is a fun place and you can see the boats going in and out and Cisco's provides some of the food, but um, it's provided by, by a dozen chefs or so. So please join us and I'm gonna stop there. We can take some more questions if there's time and um, also we can just let you have dessert and do it more informally. Mm -hmm. Oh, to grow? Yeah. I think it's about four years. Four years, three or four years. Depending on where it works. You should have been here.
there are 535 uh, ships on the working for that. And is that more than there used to be or less than there used to be on the same? Yes, more. More. When I first started, there was 250 and 300. When I first started fishing. Oh. But not all the vessels are New Bedford vessels. They're working on New Bedford. Some of them come as far as Florida. Okay. I'd like to ask uh, your experience with dealing with the regulators and establishing accurate quotas for maintaining the sustainable fish life. We've heard anecdotally that between the fishermen and the regulators, there is often tension that comes about. They say that the regulators aren't evaluating the situation. Right. The science is always two years old. By the time they send a, a ship out there and they get it, they get take it back to what's old. By the time it gets to the New England Fisheries Management Council, it's two years. So you're always working with two-year-old sayings. So that's one of the things right there. It's not, you know, right, right there. And I think before they began to do as much cooperative research, as he said, there was a lack of trust. And there was also a lot of science that was being done on giant research vessels where they would try to set fishing nets that were not really designed for vessels of that size or horsepower. And it just it was frustrating, I think, for people the who knew. Trust would tow a net that a 50-foot dragon would tow, and the albatross was 200 feet long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, just to follow on with that question a bit, uh, we've heard anecdotally that there are problems coming with the warming currents in the Gulf of Maine, particularly the weakening of the Labrador current affecting the fisheries. We were recently talking to a Canadian fisherman who said there's nothing that we have for value nearby to where we used to fish mm -hmm. of Nova Scotia. Uh, uh, are the regulators up to date with the health of the fish life and this changing of the warming of those currents and waters out there? I'm not sure they're up to date, but yeah, they're changing all the time. I mean, the water temperature has changed every year. It gets warmer and warmer. We, we're catching fish now that were never New England fish. It would be go from Mexico or down to Virginia's. And fish. I think when they, a lot of the science um, involves tagging fish, so they'll pull a fish up, put a tag on it, send it back into the ocean to kind of understand how they're migrating and they're finding fish with our tags in Iceland. So there think, are some cold yeah. water fish moving up north out of the range where you normally fish. Exactly. Yes, like those fish that are ending up in Iceland. You take Iceland their fishery is really good. They get them off the Could I get this gentleman? He was up first on our video. You mentioned Iceland. I was curious about your relationship with Icelandic fishermen. Do they come here? I see the garden from New Bedford at the Yeah, we've got a 200 mile limit. Every, every country has a 200 mile limit. You can't go outside of this. So, what are they? Oh, sure. Are they a buyer or are they. Okay, and just they stay pull the plug when it's time to pull the plug. Fine. She said that answered her question about the international. So in 1976, the 200 mile limit was put in, um, at kind of at the asking of fishing families. Um, so there were 400 foot factory trawlers that were fishing alongside at the time. Our boats were more like 60 feet, 50 to 60 feet, and uh, they were out for months at a time, not our boats. Our boats were in and out in a week or so. Their boats were out for yeah, months at a time processing, years. yeah. So it was just a diff very different scale of fishery, um, and it was depleting the resource in a significant way. Yeah, I'm sorry, I thought I asked about the offshore wind farm. Do people make any difference? You know, that's, that's an unknown question. We don't know. But I'm sure there's going to be some kind of, I'm sure, I'm not going to say, no, there will be no difference. I'm sure there's going to be a difference. There's lots of fishing around to fishermen. Right? But, in the same token, it could create habitat for some species. The, the growth, you know, mussels grow on and stuff like that. So it's going to benefit some type of fishermen, like anybody that chases scup, sea bass, anything that feeds off of mussels. 
going to increase the, that type of fishing, yeah. but it's going to, fishermen are going to sacrifice some ground. I, I work with wind farms to try to get the least impact to the fishing industry that we can get. I mean, what, the company I work for, there was a, a, a place called the New York White that's really important to scholars, and I told the company, don't even bid on that area. And they did. So maybe we'll take one or two more questions and then let you have dessert. We can continue to talk more informally. Can I ask about your quotas? Do they pass from family member to family member? They belong to the current. The current belongs to the vessel or the vessel owner. Okay. So it could be, like, if I wanted to give my permit to my son, he would get my quota. I could sell my boat, keep my uh, permit, and put my permit in permit history, and nobody uses it, or I could lease out the quota to some other Oh, there's here. one there. <laughs> What's a life expectancy average for uh, someone in a survival suit going over the side mm -hmm. in March? Depending on their position. I've, I've, I've seen people uh, survive a week, a walk, one week, and then I've seen three days, depending on your health condition. Because all they do is they provide flotation and they keep retaining water heat. Yeah. And depending on the suit, if you have an old suit that you haven't checked in a while and they start leaking, then it's hard. You mentioned the permits. Are there new permits no. issued? No. So far, there's been no new ones, and I don't see any new ones coming. Because the people that have them now are quite. There's not enough things to go around for us there now. Um, so I think we're going to break so that you can have the delicious dessert. Um, I would put in a, a couple plugs. We do have a little DVD that we produced in 2017. Rodney has got a starring role in it. So it, <laughs> there are five um, people from with very deep roots in the fishing industry and then Joe Thomas, who's a local historian who kind of ties it all together. It's a 20-minute film and then there's 20 minutes of, I wouldn't call them outtakes because they're not funny. They're just stories that are really wonderful that didn't fit into the body of the film. So. Rodney tells about his 90-some, seven-year-old grandfather who was sort of forcibly retired from lobstering at 97. They're just some wonderful, wonderful stories. So that's for sale. Um, and then a book that I produced back in 2010 uh, based on oral history interviews that we did. We've done something like 400 oral history interviews, so Tales of Cape Cod um, is kind of a neat organization because we share that, that um, desire to collect and share history. Um, so, so that uh, book, captures excerpts from some of those interviews and, and lovely photographs. Um, and I also have uh, rack cards that'll tell you how to find us when you come to New Bedford, because I know you're all going to come over the bridge this summer and, and check us out. <laughs> or sooner. Yeah, thank you.